Welcome everybody to the May 2021 edition of Gathering for Gardener, Celebration of Mind. Today's session is by Professor Frank Morgan and is titled Optimal Pentagonal Thing Tilings. Frank Morgan is Atwell Professor of Mathematics Emeritus at Williams College, where he was also the founder of the Small Undergraduate Research Project. He's won numerous awards, including being the first winner of the Mathematical Association of America HEMO National Teaching Award. He's published six books on various topics in mathematics, given numerous talks around the country and the world, and has served as vice president of both the MAA and the American Mathematical Society. You can read more about Professor Morgan on his Williams College webpage, and there are links to his personal blog as well as a mathematical blog in which he's posted many articles for the Huffington Post. And one thing that's not mentioned on that website is reference to the fact that Frank is a dancer and has gained some notoriety for one of his performances titled Dancing the Parkway. Uh, but finding and viewing that is left as an exercise for the reader. So without further ado, take it away, Frank. Well, thank you very much, Fred. It's really great to be here. It's an honor to be participating in Gathering for Gardner. Yes, talking about optimal tiles. And so the original question here was, what is the least perimeter way to tile the plane with unit areas? So in these tilings, you can see each tile has an area, which we're assuming to be one, and each tile has a perimeter around the outside, and we're trying to minimize that. In the pictured ones right here, in each one of these tilings, all the tiles are identical, but we'll also allow mixtures of tiles as long as they all have the same area, area one. And now which of all possible tilings is the most efficient? Well, the answer is the, hex the bee's hexagonal honeycomb consisting of regular hexagons, as was proved by Thomas Hales back in 2001. Now, of course, circles have less perimeter, but they don't fit together. They don't tile. So hexagons are the best tiles. When Back in 2001, when Hales proved this, it was the longest standing open problem in mathematics going back to the ancient Greeks. And it's a difficult proof. I won't talk about that. But one thing that was obvious from the beginning was that if you're going to use hexagons, regular hexagons are best because of all hexagons of unit area, the regular hexagon has the least perimeter, perimeter of about 3.72. Now, if you had to use triangles, that would be worse, but the best triangles, again, would be equilateral triangles with perimeter 4.56. Or for an intermediate case, if you, wanted, if you had to use quadrilaterals, the best quadrilaterals would be squares with perimeter four. But what if you were looking for the best tiling by pentagons? Well, now, unfortunately, you can't use the regular pentagon. It just doesn't tile. It has this weird angle of 108 degrees and they just don't fit around a vertex to produce a nice tiling that fills the plane. So you might think you can't use pentagons at all, but actually we know there are now 15 types of pentagonal tilings as was announced in 2015 with much publicity to go with it by Michael Rao. The first type was promoted back in 1918 and won a new, the last one, the 15th one came with this, this result in 2015. Um, along the way in the late seventies, four of the most recent ones were discovered by an amateur mathematician, Marjorie Rice, who read about the problem in Martin Gardner's column in her son's issue of Scientific American. And she's gonna be featured by Doris Schatzneider in her MathFest talk this summer about work on by amateur mathematicians. And Doris is here today. So you're welcome to ask me questions. Maybe you'll have a question for Doris too. And you can ask questions during the talk, just put them in the Q&A and we're happy to have questions anytime. So ready, ready anytime for questions. So there are these 15 types of pentagonal tilings, but what is best? What is best? Well, it is a tie. It's a tie between the Cairo tiling on the left and the, the so-called prismatic or house tiling on the right. You can see it looks like a little house, which has two 90 degree angles at the bottom and three 120 degree angles along the top. 
The Cairo tile on the left has the same angles. The only difference is that the two 90 degree angles, instead of being adjacent at the bottom, are opposite on the two sides. The angles don't quite determine the shape. You have to say, how tall is the house? And the answer there is that it should be circumscribed about a circle. That principle is a result called Lullier's theorem, goes back a couple centuries. Well, why is the one on the left called the Cairo tile? Well, it's for historical reasons. It's very similar to certain so-called Cairo tilings that were documented some time ago in Cairo, and not just in the museums, but right out on the streets. So, uh, so it's reported that back in the day, you could go see the Cairo tilings all over the place in Cairo, Egypt. The result was uh, published in Notices of the American Mass Society with eight student co-authors. I'm not gonna say a lot about the result, um, just a word here maybe. The proof starts with an easy argument due to uh, using Euler's formula that on average, in, this, in any tiling by pentagons, and it can be mixtures of all different kinds of pentagons, there are always at least three angles of degree three and of course, angles of degree three would have to average a third of 360 or 120 degrees. And then there's a convexity argument that says that it's best to have exactly three of exactly 120 degrees. And that means that the remaining two would average 90 degrees and it's best to have those remaining two be exactly 90 degrees. That's the idea of the proof. But the difficulty actually comes from the fact that you have to, for compactness reasons, admit degenerate pentagons, that is quadrilaterals and triangles. And the trouble with that is they're worse. So you'd think, well, just consider them separately. But then the pentagons that you're left with could have on the average 3.1 large angles. And you can hardly say that it would be best for all of them to have exactly 3.1 large angles. That doesn't make any physical sense. But the great thing about being a mathematician it doesn't have to make physical sense. You can have a, a mathematical universe in which you work, in which pentagons can have fractional numbers of angles of different sizes, and everything still works. You still have Euler's formula and so on. So that's the solution to allow such polygons. So there's the theorem published in, in 2012, but it wasn't until 2015 that I did the final part of the work and set off for Cairo, Egypt, to see if I could still find on the streets these Cairo tilings. There was a report that they were right outside the Al Bahus subway station. So after I got settled, I took the subway to the Al Bahus subway stop, and sure enough, there they were. Actually superimposed on square tiles, as you see on the left there, and sometimes paved over carelessly, but still it was just wonderful. I took great joy in luxurating in this pentagonal tiling there that I had hoped to see. And later during my visit, I found at the Al Jazeera Sporting Club, genuine large Cairo tiles, pentagonal tiles, decorated with some kind of foam or something. And this was when I published in the Mathematical Intelligencer, this is what went on the cover there, that picture of the Al Jazeera Sporting Club. Well, there's one thing lacking in this result. Um, the Cairo, we have the Cairo tiling is great. The prismatic tiling is great. Could it, is it possible that you could do equally well by mixing Cairo and prismatic tiles? So I sent out a challenge to students of the world, I said, I challenge you to prove that you can't have a tiling that mixes Cairo and prismatic. They just don't fit together. And within just a couple of days, I didn't have to wait long, there was a counterexample. In fact, infinitely many mixtures of Cairo and prismatic pentagons by a freshman at MIT by the name of Brian Chung. And his strategy was this. He noticed that you can put the Cairo tiles along a diagonal, and you can also put the prismatic tiles along a diagonal, and then you can just alternate these diagonals in any fashion you like. So in the first picture here on the left, he 
you have a chrismatic, a, pris, a chiro diagonal followed by a prismatic diagonal, followed by a chiro diagonal, followed by a prismatic diagonal. So just one of each. And the one on the, and the one on the right, there's a chiro diagonal followed by three prismatic diagonals, followed by a chiro diagonal followed by three prismatic diagonals. And you can take them any pattern like that. So there are actually uncountably many possibilities like that. So of course, I immediately went and recruited, recruited Brian Chung for my 2011 undergraduate research geometry group. And I have to say that was a very international group. Brian is from Hong Kong, Louis from Venezuela, Miguel from Mexico, and Nirali from India, although most of them are now permanent residents of the United States. So they got working on that further this summer, and they thought that they could prove that that Brian's examples by stacking these diagonals were the only possible mixtures. And I remember we were preparing for a talk on, on the subject and just the night before the talk, they discovered another mix, way to mix them together. They called it pills. It looked like a little pill box, all the pills tidily packed into the little box there. And then they found another and then they went to the web page of this amateur mathematician, Marjorie Rice, and found that she actually had one there, which was quite a surprise because she wasn't looking for perimeter minimizing tiles, but she was she loved this, these prismatic and Cairo tiles just because they were so beautiful and because they fit together in such beautiful patterns. And then they found another called sardines and another which they called stripes. So this is what in Iraq, oh, this is my favorite spaceship, I think. You can see so easily some of the beautiful symmetries that it has. There's the periodic symmetries where you can wrote doubly periodic, where you can move the green spaceship to the right, or you can move the green spaceship up, but you can also take the green spaceship and rotate and then move it onto the yellow spaceship. This is actually one of the 17 wallpaper groups, very nice group of symmetries. And they found examples with four of the 17 wallpaper groups and many other groups of symmetries too. Here's one that has just the reflective symmetries, left to right and top to bottom, which they called Christmas tree. And here was, uh, here was one that has no symmetries whatsoever, chaos. It doesn't quite have the threefold rotational symmetry. So no, there isn't, it isn't quite centered like that no symmetry at all. Here are a couple that do have the threefold rotation symmetry, which they called windmill on the left and water wheel on the right. And here was the one I like, plaza, they called. This gave me the idea that we should use one of these pentagonal tilings on the new science courtyard at Williams. Well, I kept adver advertising that for years as it was in development, but no, that never happened, but they did use it inside the new math library. So there's one of those Cairo prismatic pentagonal tilings in the math library. Here was the student's favorite, so-called bunny, right? You can see the two ears up there, two ears on the bunny. Yeah, that was their favorite. Norali, one of the students who did this, had this to say about this search for all possible mixtures. We tried to characterize all tilings by Cairo and prismatic pentagons, but we just kept finding more and more, and with 10 different symmetry groups. Will we ever find them all? So we did keep finding more and more. The successive group in 2013, one of the members there, Maggie Miller, found these four new ones, all interesting. I like the teeth one on the lower left. Maggie, by the way, had a, so I was just uh, talking to her. She was she went to Princeton for graduate school where she received an award both for teaching and for starting a, a, a woman's mathematician and for working with a women's mathematician club that they started there at Princeton. She's now a postdoc at MIT. Then I was invited one time to substitute in Colin Adams' 
topology class, and I mentioned this problem, and Victor Liu came up with this new example. And you know, so here's how he sent it to me. You have to be quite an artist to do these. You know, you try to start drawing these pictures and they have to be accurate enough to be sure that it's really a Cairo tile and that it'll keep going on forever. So I was very proud of him for finding that one. And then there was a better method that another student, uh, oh, by the way, then Glenn Whitney, who was president of the Museum for Mathematics in New York City, uh, used the computer to give a, a better version of this and reassured us that it actually will, you can see that it will go on forever. And he actually discovered a variation of it, which loses the symmetry, displacing the center a little bit. So that was an interesting variation by, by him. And I think Cindy Lawrence of Museum of Mathematics now is here at the talk today. So if you have any questions for her too, she's here today, I think. Yeah, so good. Here was, a, here was one discovered by another student, Samantha Petty, and she had the help, a friend of hers, Ben Hoyle, made some little cardboard cutouts that she could use for, for testing whether this mixture really fit together right. Of course, what you really need are some nice plastic pieces. So to get that, uh, you have to wait a little while. Glenn Whitney went on and made some of these, some variations on the Petty example. He got good at this. So once you find one example, it often leads to many others. But the best kits for doing this are the nice plastic pieces that Laura Tallman does with her 3D printing. Now, at the, at the gathering for Gardner Center last month, she gave a nice talk about some of the really three-dimensional ones. But we were delighted back in the day when she just made some nice 2D Cairo and prismatic tiles so that we could make the Cairo tiling and the prismatic tiling here in orange and red and then some of the mixtures like the water wheel. And then we took some of these tiles and exhibited them at the Museum for Mathematics in New York City and invited visitors there to try to come up with new examples of prismatic tilings. And here this fifth grader, Christian Green, found this beautiful new one here, which they now, which was placed to decorate the wall there, which he called center ice because it reminded of him of his hockey uh, field. He's a, he's an ice hockey player and asked him about this, this wonderful example. And this is what Christian had to say. Hi, my name is Christian Green and I'm 11 years old. I think I discovered my Pentagon pattern because I like to play with fractals when I was a little. I named my, my, my pattern center ice because I play ice hockey as a goalie. And I'm constantly thinking about angles. Yeah, and there he is. There's a picture showing some of the angles that he thinks about. Yeah, so good. Well, now, one of the flaws in the theorem I mentioned today, I, I, I tried to de-emphasize it when I was giving the talk, was that it only says that these, pen, these tilings, the pentagonal, uh, the prismatic and Cairo tilings and those mixtures are minimizing in the category of convex pentagonal tiles. And so what we, what we weren't able to prove back then, we weren't able to eliminate non-convex tiles mixed in with them. Now a non-convex tile is very inefficient by bulging, if it bulged out, it would get much more area for the amount of perimeter that it's using. But there's still the possibility that somehow just mixing in a few of these expensive non-convex tiles might make it possible for all the other tiles to be more nearly regular and thus result in the average perimeter going down. And that remains, and, and, and so I gave that question to my undergraduate research geometry group in 2012, and they talked about it at the Madison Math Fest. Here you can see them right there in Madison on the banks of Lake Monoma. And Zane had some things to say about that, that effort to try to eliminate non-convex tiles in the ideal tiling. So this summer, we considered tilings in the plane by pentagons. Last year's geometry group had the best tilings by convex pentagons, but were unable to remove the convexity assumption from their results. We found some restrictions this year on the types of convex and non-convex tilings that might do better. 
So that question, they got some partial results, but that question remains open today. And I think I'll leave you with that. Thanks very much. So there is a question in the Q&A about uh, a link to uh, the Pentagon tiles. I wonder if they're in Thingiverse. Uh, I don't know. Cindy, did we ever, were we able to sell them at Museum of Math? Were you able to ever sell those kits? Oh, so Alyssa Kranz says that Laura's designs are online, so you can find them, find them there. Yes, very good, very good. No, we never managed. We were going to sell kits at the Museum of Math, but Cindy said we never actually did that. I don't know. We maybe we should do that, Cindy. We can, maybe you can make some more money there. Yeah, I think you'd charge a lot for them. Yeah, it's more fun trying with kits because if you try to do it in pencil and paper, it's really hard. Joshua Holden says some of those tilings appear to be quasi crystals. Are they and have any been found in nature? Uh, uh, I, uh, so are any quasi crystals? No, not that I know of. And, uh, and I don't know of the chiroprismatic tilings occurring in nature anywhere, but that would be great to find. And, you know, certainly in the history of math, there have been so many stories about where mathematicians looked and looked for years and then the things turned up in nature, the where fail and counter example to the 100 year old Kelvin conjecture was uh, provided by these two physicists who knew about it from nature and mathematicians had searched diligently for hundreds of years for those 100 for 100 years using computers and so on and never found it. So that's a great idea. Uh, now there's another question here I see from Ali Munyans, who says that Ed Pegg found a way to seven color tiles based on the prismatic tiling with extra tiles cut out around some of the vertices so that no two points of unit distance have the same color. If the tiny tiles could be removed entirely, we'd have a better upper bound of the chromatic number of the plane problem. Have you thought about if these mixed tiles could improve on Peg's result in terms of minimizing the area of the seventh color? Wow, never thought, never heard about any of this. Isn't that great? Out Ali, maybe you could add a link to Ed, Ped's, Ed Pegg's page on that in the, in the chat. That would be great to have. What an interesting thing. Wow, you people know so much. This is fantastic. Ruth Favreau says, how did the students, the first group in 2011, find their patterns? Hand drawing, computer, tiles. Uh, so the first, the first examples, it was just this... Uh, mental discovery by Brian Chung. I mean, he just came up with uh, this idea of the diagonals by just, I think, thinking about it, just by thinking about it. Then people tried, then they, then they tried drawing sketches, pencil and paper, but that's very difficult to do to keep it accurate. And so the next move was using computers to do these drawings because then you're assured that they're more accurate. Uh, playing with the tiles was definitely the most fun way of going about it. Uh, Brian Chung, if you want to, since I mentioned him there, maybe you want to meet him too. I think he had a word to say about this. The mysterious question about whether we can mix in non-convex pentagons to beat chiroprismatic tilings remains open on the plane, but we settled it for some small flat toric. So you see, he's a real theoretical guy. And instead of looking at the various possibilities in the plane, he started tiling small tori, which you tie with maybe just four or five tiles, so there aren't many possibilities. He liked these theoretical questions. Paul D says, any use for evolutionary search? You know, that's a very hot topic right now about uh, there's so many possible ways that our evolutionary history uh, could have evolved and in trying to figure out how it happened. And that same kind of thing occurs in so many different areas of science and mathematics. And people try to model how these, how, how graphs can branch and fit back together. And so that's really a whole field nowadays. Could this contribute to that? I don't see how, but if you found a way of doing that, Paul, that would be fantastic. I don't know. E.T. Trigg says, has anyone investigated space filling mixtures of minimal surface area 
polyhedra. Oh yeah, so the 3D version of this question, the 3D version of this question is exactly that, that uh, question that I mentioned, uh, the, the Kelvin conjecture said that the best tiling of three space is by this truncated octahedron. So you take the regular octahedron and then you cut the, it won't tile. But if you trim the corners off, you get this 14 hedron, which has less surface area and tiles beautifully. And he was sure that would be the best. And then Warren Phelan found this better example in nature, which is now believed to be the best, but there are no proofs of any of this. That's a whole area of study. But if you look up the Kelvin conjecture and the Ware Phelan counterexample, just Google those, you'll find a wealth of interesting developments. John Golden, interesting enough, said uh, that Christopher Danielson made nice models of the 15 types of pentagonal tilings in wood. Isn't that beautiful? That's a comment from John Golden. Uh, Jet mentioned that insect shells have pentagons and hexagons in them. Yeah, you know, if you want to, for example, tile the sphere, you can't use all hexagons. You need to have 12 pentagons. You can have 12 pentagons and almost any number of hexagons with one exception. Yeah, Trig made the interesting comment here that looking in higher dimensions has the, is even interesting if all you care about is the plane because the slices sometimes give you lower dimensional patterns that are interesting. Okay, well, I think it's probably time to close it out. Okay, thanks again, Frank. Enjoyed it. Pleasure meeting you, virtually, if nothing else. Yes, Fred. Well, we'll meet someday. Okay. Okay, bye, everybody.